And hello from the campus of Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We welcome you to the Software Engineering Institute's webinar series. Our presentation today is Tactical Cloudlets, Moving Cloud Computing to the Edge by Grace Lewis. Depending on your location, we wish you a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. My name is Shane McGraw, your moderator for today, and I'd like to thank you for attending. We want to make today as interactive as possible, so we will take questions throughout the presentation and again at the end of the presentation. You can submit your questions to our event staff at any time through the questions tab on your control panel. We will also ask a few polling questions throughout the presentation. They will appear as a pop-up window on your screen. Another three tabs I'd like to point out are the files, Twitter, and survey tabs. The file tab has a copy of the PDF, a PDF copy of the presentation slides there now, along with other work from the SEI in mobile computing. The survey tab will appear at the end of the presentation, and we ask that you fill out as your feedback is always greatly appreciated. And for those of you using Twitter, be sure to follow at SEI News and use the hashtag SEI Cloud. Once again, follow at SEI News and the hashtag is SEI Cloud. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter for today. Grace Lewis is a principal researcher at the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. She's the deputy lead for the Advanced Mobile Systems Initiative and the principal, uh, principal investigator for the edge-enabled projects, or for edge-enabled tactical systems research project. Her current interests and in projects in mobile computing, cloud computing, and service oriented architecture. Her latest publications include multiple papers and articles on these subjects and a book in the SEI Software Engineering Series. She is also a member of the technical faculty for the Masters in Software Engineering program at Carnegie Mellon University. And now I'd like to turn it over to Grace Lewis. Grace, welcome, all yours. Thank you, thank you so much. What I'm going to talk about today is some of the research that we've been doing in an area called Tactical Cloudlets. Um, I would start, I would like to start this, it's more, it's going to be more like a story because I'm going to be telling you about how we started with this research, where we are now, and where we're going into the future. So the motivation for this research is that soldiers, first responders, and field personnel that operate in tactical environments are making increased use of applications like such as speech recognition, such as facial recognition, mission planning, a lot of applications that take a heavy, a real heavy toll on computing power and battery power. And if you think about the, op the environments in which these people operate, they're what we call edge environments. They're environments with a very dynamic context because, for example, if you're in, a, if you're in an emergency rescue situation, you, know, you could be in a period of, of I want to say peace at a moment, but then something could happen, some you know, natural event could happen. There are also limited computing resources. Why? Because handheld devices, it doesn't matter you know, how much we advance in, in computing, handheld devices are always going to lag behind their desktop counterparts. There are also high levels of stress if you think of the, um, in the environments in which these people operate. And finally, there's intermittent, intermittent network connectivity just because they're operating at the edge. So what we're trying to do in our research is to come up with these, ca these tactical cloudlets. Um, you can think of them as data centers in a box. Um, and the idea is that they, they provide cloud capabilities at the edge that can lead to better situational awareness and also um, better decision making, even if they're disconnected from the enterprise. So as I said before, the goal behind this research is to provide cloud computing capabilities at the edge. For what? For things such as computation offload, I'm talking about offload of expensive computation, for data staging, and eventually leading to increased survivability of mobile systems. From a research and development perspective, what we were targeting with tactical cloudlets was discoverable resources. We wanted these cloudlets to be located in the field and for them to be discovered by uh, the smartphones of personnel operating in the field. We wanted them to be able to operate in what is now called DIL environments. DIL stands for disconnected, intermittent, and limited, which means that there is not always connectivity. If you look at the diagram on the right side of the slide, there is not always going to be connectivity between those cloudlets or offload elements and the central core enterprise cloud. Um, we also wanted to take a systems perspective. Um, based on a systematic literature review that we did in this area, a lot, there is a lot of work in, in, in in cloudlets and in cyber foraging, which is one of the main topics I'm going to talk about today. Um, and this work is very interesting. It's, it's, it's very promising, but it's really focusing on the, 
the offload operation, the, how complex it is, the algorithms for making sure that the offload operation happens. And we really want to take more of a systems perspective. We want to th think about survivability. We want to think about trust. We want to think about how easy it would be to develop for these environments and also to deploy because we're thinking about fielded operational systems. And finally, as part of our research, we wanted to create a very flexible architecture that would support our research and our experimentation. So on this, on this slide, you will see a, a screen from, the, from our tactical cloud implementation. It's the Cloudlet Manager screen. And I will talk about it later. But basically, what if, we, if I were to define tactical cloudlets, I would define them as forward deployed, discoverable, virtual machine based. I'm talking about servers. When I say server, it's a laptop. It could be a larger computer. But they're basically forward deployed. They are deployed in proximity of the people who use them. They can be hosted on vehicles. They can be hosted on other platforms. And what do tactical clouds provide? They provide an infrastructure on which to offload computation. They provide forward data staging for a mission. So for example, if I know that I'm eventually going to use certain data on a mission, I can use these clouds to store this data so it can be available for me when I need it. I can also use Cloudless to do data filtering. Let's say I'm receiving, a, I'm receiving a lot of information from the cloud or from the enterprise or from the data center. I could have these, these Cloudless do some, some pre-filtering on data such that on the mobile device, I don't receive a large amount of information, but I receive really what I just need. And finally, I can also use them in the opposite direction, meaning I can use Cloudless as collection points for data heading to enterprise reposit, repositories. So for example, I am capturing data at the edge, I'm offloading it onto these cloudlets, and these clouds are serving basically as intermediaries um, for data heading to enterprise repositories. Which brings us to a very key concept in tactical cloudlets, which is cyber foraging. So cyber foraging is a concept that was coined in 2001 by one of our collaborators on, on campus, Mahadev Satyanaranian, although he goes by Satya. And he referred to cyber foraging as being to leverage external resources uh, resource rich, rich surrogates, in this case cloudlets, that would augment the capabilities of resource limited mobile devices. When we talk about cyber foraging, we're re really talking about two different types of cyber foraging. We're talking about code or computation offload, which means that we're offloading expensive computation. Why? Because I'm trying to extend battery life and I'm also trying to increase computational capability. Or I'm talking about data staging, which is I'm trying to improve data transfers between mobile computings and the cloud by temporarily staging data in transit and potentially doing some processing on that data. So if, if I tie the two concepts together, I tie tactical cloudlets, which is what I explained earlier, and I tie it with cyber foraging, what we're really promoting in our research is cloudlet-based cyber foraging. So in this case, going back to the diagram that I had earlier, you have these cloudlets which are located in single hop proximity of the mobile devices. So we're talking about a single hop network. And these cloudlets can be or may not be connected um, to the enterprise cloud, but this, and this can be a multi or a single hop connection. So the idea is that they can operate in a disconnected mode, meaning that potentially I could have cloudlets pre-provisioned and I only need to communicate with that central cord for just for the provisioning part. Um, in cloudlet-based cyber foraging, in order to take advantage of the, uh, of the types of applications that are used in the field, they're statically partitioned into a, a very thin client and a very, you can call it a very thick server, a computation intensive server that runs on the cloudlet. Okay, folks, that's going to lead to our first polling question today, uh, where we want to make sure the audience is just um, understanding where we're at and kind of let you drive the, the flow of the presentation. So you'll see that as a pop-up on your screen now, asking, is the concept of cyber foraging clear? And we'll give you about 10 or 15 seconds to vote on that. Based on that, we'll drive the flow of the presentation. Okay, uh, we'll close the poll now. We got 82% saying yes, to Grace, so we are free to, to move on. Wonderful. So going back to, to the story that I'm going to be telling, we came up with what we call a reference architecture for cloudlet-based cyber foraging. I will slowly try to go through some of the elements of this diagram. So in a cyber foraging system, there are two main components that are noted by the, by the dashed boxes. You have the mobile client, which could be, for example, a smartphone, and a lot of exp our experimentation has been done with using smartphones as mobile clients. And you have a cloudlet host. A cloudlet host, as I said before, it can be a laptop, it can be a more powerful server. But the key is that uh, 
the mobile client and the clouded host are in single hot proximity. What I mean by this is that they are connecting via Wi-Fi as opposed to 3G or 4G, which is not only, which is not only more, um, it has higher latency, but also um, it is known that there are many studies that show that it, it consumes more battery. So they're located in single hot proximity. They communicate using Wi-Fi. So on the clouded host side, there is, a, there is an important part, which is called a discovery service. So a discovery service, what that discovery service is doing, it's, it's using a broadcast, broadcast mechanism to basically tell the, the mobile devices that are around it, uh, I'm a cloudlet, I'm a cloudlet, I'm a cloudlet, and, it's, tra and it's, it's transmitting some form of metadata, and we'll talk about the different options later. So that's one main piece on the, on the clouded host side. On the mobile client side, the only piece of software that needs to run, in addition to the applications, is a cloudlet client. So the clouded client on the mobile client side is able to detect that there are cloudlets in, in, in the area. And part of, what the, part of what the discovery service is broadcasting is the information that allows the client, clouded client to communicate with the cloudlet server, which is a component that is on the, on the right side. And so basically, the cloudlet client is in charge of establishing the, that initial handshake between the, between the mobile client and the cloud, clouded host. So what happens once, the, once that initial handshake is established is that the cloudlet client and I will talk about different forms of provisioning, tells the Cloudlet server what is the computation that it wants to run. When the Cloudlet server finds out what computation it needs to run, it basically, it start, it basically starts up what we call a service VM, a service virtual machine, that corresponds to the server portion of that application. It starts it as a VM inside the VM manager and notifies the, uh, the Cloudlet client that is ready to run, and therefore the Cloudlet uh, ready application can start interacting with that part of the server. In general, that's how cloudlet based cyber foraging works. So this is a reference architecture, and what I'm going to show you in the next slides are different ways in which we instantiated that architecture. And at the end, I'm going to show you what, based on some experimentation and some, some other work that we did, what we ended up selecting as our cloudlet implementation. So for cyber foraging to happen, three operations need to happen. First, there's a cloudlet discovery process. Then there's a cloudlet provisioning and setup process. And finally, there's the application execution process. In the cloudlet discovery, as I said before, the, the mobile device discovers that there are cloudlets around it and selects a cloudlet. And the second step is when we set up that cloudlet for execution, for executing the application that I want to run. And finally, the actual execution of the application. So in cloudlet discovery, what do we do? So basically, the what we use as our as our discovery protocol, it's a it's an it's an implementation of something called zero conf or zero configuration, and it's basically it's a it's multi it's based on multicast addresses and DNS. So basically, the cloud that in advance, what the discovery service does is it registers it registers uh, for multicast, and then when the cloudlet client is ready to discover uh, to discover cloudlet, what it does is it says, is there a, are there any services out there that we've tagged with the with the tag cloudlet TCP, and based on that, the data is transmitted back to the cloudlet client. So basically, that is how the, that is the mechanism that um, that a mobile device uses or a mobile client uses for discovering or locating available clouds. Now, the second part, and probably the most crucial part of the process, is the cloudlet provisioning process. So basically, cloudlet provisioning is the process by which we configure and deploy that service VM that corresponds to the server portion of the application that wants to be executed. We, as part of trying to select which was the best cloudlet provisioning mechanism, we instantiated five different versions of this reference architecture. And we investigated five different cloud provisioning mechanisms. We investigated uh, two cloud provisioning mechanisms that are in which the cloud is provisioned at runtime. One is called VM synthesis. The other is called application virtualization. We investigated two, which are based on, they're really done a, at uh, deployment time, which is in which cloudlets are really pre-provisioned based on mission needs. And then finally, we, we tried a fifth approach, which is more or less a combination of, the, of a runtime and deployment time approach, where capabilities are assembled at runtime. And this resembles more what happens in, in data centers nowadays. And it's called on-demand provisioning. So the as I said in, in one of my previous slides, uh, the, the term cyber foraging was, was coined by one of our collaborators on campus, um, Satya. And when he envisioned this cloudlet concept, the way he envisioned provisioning these cloudlets uh, was with something called VM synthesis. VM synthesis is a very, uh, it's a very novel and also complex uh, and clever process for provisioning, where basically what, is, what happens with VM synthesis is that the cloudlet is provisioned at runtime by sending something called an application overlay from the mobile device to the cloudlet. Now, 
Application overlays have to be constructed in advance so that they can be stored on the mobile device and transmitted to the cloud limit runtime. So the, uh, the diagram on this chart, basically what it explains is the VM synthesis process. So the key element behind VM synthesis is something called a base VM. A base VM, what it, what it basically is, is a VM with that has on and installed everything that our organization considers its baseline, its operating system, its security uh, mechanisms, it's any, anything that it considers its baseline is part of this base VM. And this base VM is key to this concept because the base VM has to be available um, to build the application overlays, but it also has to be available at runtime, and you'll see why. So to construct a VM overlay, what happens is the following. A base VM is obtained by, from a central core. A VM, as, you all, as, as all of you know, it's basically a VM, EM, VM image is a file. So when I say it obtains the base VM, it basically what it obtains is, is two files from the central core. It obtains a base memory snapshot and it obtains a base, uh, a base disk snapshot. And so basically what happens at this point in time is that I start that base VM. I start it, as I start it inside my, my VM manager. What I do after that is I install the application, I start the application, and then I suspend the application. When I suspend an application, what happens is that at that point in time, the disk and memory snapshots are, are saved on disks. So what, I ha what happens after that is I, I calculate the binary difference between the files after the installation process and the files before the installation process. And those two files, which are really a binary diff, constitute what is called the application overlay. Now this happens at deploy time, and there, therefore for each, for each application that I want to run, I have to install the client for that application, right? Which is, a, which is basically an app, and I have to install these two files which, which correspond to the application overlay. So what happens at runtime is the reverse of that process. So what happens at runtime is that um, the cloud that contains the base VM, it receives the overlay, and it applies the overlay to that base VM. So what happens at the end is that I have the state at which the VM was suspended in the, in the previous slide. So if you look at the sequence diagram on the, on the left, what happens to a VM synthesis, as I said before, is that the Cloudlet client sends a base VM ID um, to the Cloudlet server, it locates that base VM, and it, re it obviously returns whether it found, it found it or if it didn't find it. If it did find it, then what the Cloudlet client does is that it transmits the application overlay to the Cloudlet server, um, it decompresses it because it, it, it does the VM synthesis process, which is what I talked about before, combining the base VM with the overlay, and then it creates a service VM and starts that service VM, and it tells, now it tells the Cloudlet client, I am ready and I am listening at this particular server port, um, IP address and port. Now, this is, like I said before, it's the, it's the, it's the process by which Cloudlets were envisioned. It was, it was the initial process. Um, but let's look a little bit at the data that we had when we ran some of these experiments. So you will see that for all of these provisioning mechanisms, we, we executed experiments for, for four different applications. We executed um, with a face recognition application running on Windows, an object recognition application running on Linux, and a speech application, uh, both a, a Windows version and a Linux version, because we also wanted to understand some of the differences there. So as you can see from the payload size, so the payload size, and this is gonna be the same for all the charts and the, all the other mechanisms, is the size of the whatever, in this case it's the overlay, that is sent from the, from the mobile client to the Cloudlet at runtime. Application ready time is measured as the time between uh, a Cloudlet client says, I, I need a Cloudlet and I want it to execute this service until the Cloudlet replies, I am ready for execution. And, for, and Cloudlet energy is basically measured in joules is how much energy is spent by the mobile device during this process. So as you can see, the payload when we use VM synthesis is quite large. It ranges from 55 megabytes for a, for a face recognition application all the way up to 332 megabytes for an object recognition application. Now, if we tie this data back to our initial, uh, our initial talk about um, the characteristics of, of edge environments, this is quite a large payload to send when you're talking about DIL environments, where you're talking about environments with intermittent connectivity, where you're not really sure you're gonna have the connectivity that you need. Application ready time compared to the other methods, and I'll show you that data later, is also, is also quite, quite large because the VM synthesis uh, process obviously takes time. And, 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 and we've, we've uh, shown what many others have already proven, which is that um, payload size is, is really almost directly correlated to, to energy because um, um, 
data transmission consumes a lot of energy. So the larger the payload, the more the energy is going to be consumed. Now, that, that is from a quantitative point of view. And from a qualitative point of view, um, let's look at what has to, what has to happen on, on each of the sides of the, of the system. So what has to be on the cloudlet um, in addition to the, the cloudlet server and all that stuff? Well, the, the, those, the exact base VMs, meaning that I have to have the, the base VMs from which the application overlays were built. If you look at the mobile device side, I have to have um, the application overlays, and I also have to have, obviously, the client apps and the metadata. The payload, in this case, is the application overlay. Now, advantages of VM synthesis is basically that anything that I can install in a base VM, I can run. So that's a huge, a huge advantage because it gives you a lot of flexibility. But the constraints are that you require the same exact base VM. And this can become pro uh, problematic when you're talking about distributions and patches because every time the base VM changes, you would have to reconstruct all the overlays because it's only possible to reconstruct the overlay from the same exact base VM. So that is, that is VM synthesis, and that is the first mechanism that we tried. And like I said before, I wanted to tell you a story. So yes, we were happy this worked. The, the concept that, that Satya had envisioned, it was, it was perfect, perfectly feasible, but we were very concerned about payload size. So we, we started looking into other approaches and other ways of doing this. So we looked into something called application virtualization. So basically what application virtualization is, is you, you use tools like, for example, CDE or Cameo. You use them to basically create a, a, an application package. And inside that application package, it contains everything that it needs to run. So basically, it's, it's almost like OS virtualization, where you're tricking an application into thinking that it's, that it's, that it's self-contained, that it's running independently. So in, in, in application virtualization, the package is no longer an application overlay. The, sorry, the payload is no longer an application overlay. The payload is a virtualized application, which is basically a package. So the Cloudlet, this is another runtime provisioning mechanism. So the Cloudlet transmits the application, sorry, the mobile device transmits the application overlay at runtime from the mobile client to the, to the Cloudlet. So um, looking at the, at the sequence diagram on the left, so the Cloudlet client sends um, the application uh, metadata to the Cloudlet server. Uh, by application metadata, it's basically saying, I'm a Linux-based application. I need this version of Linux, or at least the, the OS family I'm talking about. The Cloudlet server finds a matching guest VM. It means uh, it finds a VM that has an operating system that can run the uh, virtualized application. And it tells it if it, if it, if it found it or not. If it's found, then, based, then at that point in time, I send the virtualized application, which once again is a package. So in this case, what the Cloudlet server does is it start up, starts up a copy of a matching guest VM. It deploys the application inside that VM, and it basically starts the application and tells the, and tells the, Cloudlet, um, the Cloudlet client that it's ready. Now, if we look at the data, I'm, talk, I'm, look, I'm talking about the upper, upper right. Um, we'll see that the payload is much smaller. It's much smaller than for, that, than for VM synthesis. We're talking about uh, 14 megabytes as opposed to, for example, 55 from the last side for payload size for a face application. And the largest in this case is, is speech, um, the, both, the, both the Windows and the Linux version with 66 and 68 megabytes. It's a lot, a lot, sm a lot smaller. And that, like I said before, there's a direct correlation between payload size and client energy. It decreases the amount of energy spent on the spent on the mobile device. And application ready time is also diminished, not only because it's sending less data, but also because really all, there is no VM synthesis process. All you're doing is really taking an, a packaged application and putting it inside a, a running VM, uh, a, a running VM, yes. So in this case, what is the Cloudlet content? The Cloudlet content is that you have to have a VM that is compatible with the server code that I just sent over. On the mobile device, I need to have the virtualized server code, which in this case is an application package. And of course, I have to have my client apps and my, and my metadata. And the payload is that virtualized server code or package. Now, advantages are, it, are really portability across always distribution boundaries, because all that you need to know is, you know, I'm going to be running a Linux-based application or a Windows-based application. And then and that gives you a lot of flexibility. Now, the constraints is that the tools that are available nowadays to build these application packages are not perfect. They're good, but they're not perfect. Because what happens when you're creating one of these packages is that you have to run these tools, and what they, that what they try to do is they try to capture all possible dependencies of the application so that it can be, be self-contained in this package. And uh, you, there's a lot that you can miss, um, whether you're trying to look at the way the product was installed or the way the, the, way the product is running. There's a lot that could be missed, or there is a lot of, there's a large margin for error because if you, if you missed a dependency, um, your, your, your virtualized application is not going to work. So 
on, on the one hand, we were able to reduce payload size, application ready time, and, and client energy, but we were introducing some error because there's a possibility that not all dependencies could be captured. So we said, okay, what if we just don't do this at runtime at all? What if we, for a moment, assume that we can pre-provision cloudlets? And one of the things I'm gonna say at the end is that if you look at edge environments, it's not, it's not too, too crazy to think about this, that think about that, the fact that a cloudlet could be pre-provisioned at, at, at deployment time with all the VMs that I need based on, um, on mission needs. So if I'm going to do certain things, I might need some mapping VMs, I may need some face recognition, some speech recognition, some situational awareness VMs. So we looked into a technique that basically we called cache VM. It's, it's an extremely simple technique, but basically, like I said before, instead of, instead of trying to build, and to transfer and to build these, these VMs at runtime, what I do is I basically have a cache of VMs, which is why we call it cache VMs. So I have a bunch of service VMs in a service repository. And so what happens at runtime, I'm looking at the sequence diagram on the left, is that I tell the Cloudlet client tells the server, do you have a service with this, with this VM ID? So the VM, the VM IDs in our case were face, object, speech, whatever. And so basically the cloud server finds the service VM, it tells it, yes, I, I, have that, I have that service VM that you need. And what happens on the server then is that it creates a, a copy of that, of that VM and it starts it up for the, for the cloud client and it says, here, it's ready. So the payload size in this case is, it's, 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 it's really nothing because it's just a service VM ID. Right, so so we, you could say that the payload size is zero. The application ready time is extremely fast because basically you already have a VM, and like like I said before, we we save the suspended state. So starting it, starting up is is very quick, and obviously that reduces um, client energy, of course, because the payload is so small, as well as the application ready time. Um, in this case, what you have to have on the cloudlet is that service VM repository. Um, what you have on that mobile device is, um, in addition, obviously, to the Cloudlet client, is client app metadata, and the payload, as I said before, is simply a service ID. So, what are the what are the advantages? The advantages are, well, in addition to uh, to what I just said, you no know, small payload and small and small consumption of energy. Um, it's the fact that I can I can update my service VMs without any problem, which which is, was the problem with the first uh, technique with VM synthesis. Because as long as the service ID remains the same, I can still find the service VM that I the ID remains the same. I can update the service and nothing happens. Now the constraint is that the cloud that has to be pre-provisioned with these with these uh, VMs that are required by an app. So it's it's. I better do a good job of trying to figure out what my what should be on my cloudlet, and or. I could think about the possibility of the cloudlet being connected to the core to be able to obtain this, these service VMs if I don't have them. So again, that's the advantage, uh, lots of advantages, but it does have the constraint or the disadvantage that I talked about, which is that you do have to have these, um, have to anticipate what are the services that you're going to need. Now, if you're in the field, it's sometimes it might be difficult to, to, to have a, like a pre-provisioned mobile device with all the client applications that you need. So what if we do something a little bit similar to cache VM, but in addition to having a repository with service VMs, what if we also have a repository with the client apps? So this is more or less like having, having an app store on the Cloudlet, and we call this Cloudlet push just because it was kind of pushing the, the application in this direction. So in this case, what happens at runtime, I'm gonna use the sequence diagram to explain what happens, is that the Cloudlet client would tell the Cloudlet server, instead of saying, Tell, instead of saying, can you start the service VM for me, it basi it's basically saying, tell me what you have. What, what, what services do you have? What applications do you have? And so the Cloudlet server in this case returns a list. And, once the, and the Cloudlet client can select from that list the application that it wants, like I said, similar to an app store. Um, it sends back the client app. The client app is installed on the mobile device. And in the meantime, what happens is very similar to what just happened in Cache VM, which is that the service VM had started and basically the, uh, the app is informed that it is ready to run. So the payload size in this case is also very small, like in the, in the, pa in the previous case, because um, what it sends over, in this case, the payload is going from the Cloudlet server to the, to the mobile client, is an APK, or I mean, it, because we use, just because we use Android, but it's, a, it's an app file, it's small, especially because we were talking about having thin clients. Um, application ready time is also considerably small because it, as, at the same time that it's starting the, the server on the server side, it's installing the client application and that really doesn't take a lot of time because, as I said before, they're very small applications which also leads to a low energy consumption. Um, 
On the Cloudlet, what do I have to have? Well, I have to have a repository, not only of the service VMs, but of their corresponding apps, of course. On the mobile device, I really don't need anything other than the Cloudlet client, so it's none. Um, the, the payload in this case is the client app and all its metadata, all that the client would need in order to install the application. Um, the advantage is that um, it really has distribution at runtime, so it can really support a lot of mobile devices and applications and mission needs. But obviously the constraint is that if I'm going to have uh, an app store, if I'm going to have to have paired service VMs with their applications, um, I, ha I would have to have at least either knowledge or a variety of, of versions of the app that would match the uh, mobile client that is being used. So we looked at provisioning mechanisms at runtime. We looked at provisioning mechanisms at deployment time. Um, and, and we took a step back and we said, okay, what do, what do real cloud data centers do? How do they provision VMs? How do they get a VM ready for execution? And uh, what, what, we, what we discovered, because it's common practice nowadays, is that what companies do in, in, in organizations, for example, that are setting up their private clouds internally in their organizations, is that they use um, things called cl um, cloud provisioning tools. So for example, Puppet. Puppet is an example of a cloud provisioning tool. Chef is another example of a, of a cloud provisioning tool. And so basically, in the, in the, in the data centers, in the, in the private clouds, uh, what, a, what a client, in this case a, a person or an organization, would do is say, hey, I need a VM, I need a VM with these characteristics. Or, or, and what the, the organization would have is a set of scripts that correspond to different versions of VMs that, that people would need. And so what we did was something very similar. So on the right side, uh, on the right side, the bottom right, where I have the sequence diagram. In this case, what is being sent from the Cloudlet client to the Cloudlet server is a provisioning script, which is basically a list of instructions saying, I want a VM and I want it to have these characteristics, so I want it to have these, pro these, these products in it. And the Cloudlet server in this case would respond, yes, I can, I can put that VM together for you or not. And if it can, basically what it does is that it's, it starts up whatever the, it considers its baseline VM, it does, and it starts putting it together. It basically it starts installing, installing products in it. It basically runs the, the provisioning script. And once, when it's done, it starts the server and it informs the Cloudlet client that it is ready. So it's very similar to the other, it's very similar to the other methods, but in this case, what is happening is that it's being built at runtime. There's nothing pre-built other than the provisioning script. So in this case, and you'll see some of the, some of the differences with the other mechanisms here, um, the payload size is also very small because these scripts, we used, uh, we used Puppet in our implementation, they're very small. Um, and, but the application ready time is quite large. The application ready time is quite large because it takes time. It takes time to assemble these VMs because what the cloud that server is doing is at runtime it's putting it together. And this large application ready time leads to, to um, high client energy because even if the mobile device is just waiting, it's still consuming energy. So you could, you could we did other, we did, we collected other data where we tried to subtract that time to try to make it, it just really the provisioning time. But in reality, the application is just sitting there waiting for something to happen and it is consuming energy. So, um, what does the Cloudlet need to have in this case? Well, it has to have a VM provisioning software. In our case, like I said, it was Puppet. And it has to have all the server code components. What I mean is that it would have to have kind of like a repository of all the potential components that can go inside a virtual machine. The mobile device needs to have the, the VM provisioning script and all the client app and metadata like the previous ones. And as far as payload, what is sent from the, cl from the, client, from the client to the server at runtime is this VM provisioning script. So the advantages is basically that it's, it's really increased flexibility because pretty much as long as you have all the components, you can build whatever service VM you want. But that in, that's really its disadvantage as well because you would have to have access to all these components at runtime in order to put the VM together, whether these components already exist on the cloud itself or whether you're obtaining the, these, um, these components from other repositories, in which case you would need kind of like a connected cloud. -it. So that more or less is the summary of of how we how we got to where we are now by t by starting these different these different mechanisms. So once the cloud is provisioning, all five mechanisms, depend, regardless of which mechanism you work we, you use, work exactly the same. So after receiving the uh, after the client receives the service VM IP address and port, what the cl what the cloud client does is it returns this information to the cloud ready app, and in in the cloud ready app 
basically opens a socket to the service um, VM and starts interacting with it in client server mode until basically the app is closed. So the application, like I said, it's it's very it's very simple. They all they all function the same way. You just open a port and you start interacting with it in you know pure client server way. Okay, this will lead us to polling question two, and we'd like to know, and I'll pose that now to your screen: is the cloud <coughs> is the cloudlet concept clear? And we'll, we'll give you about. 15, 20 seconds to vote for that. While we're waiting for that, Grace, let's get to a question from sure. Tim asking, how does cyber foraging relate to mobile cloud computing? Okay, that's a that's a that's a good question. So mobile cloud computing is is it's it's more of an overarching term, which describes, as its name indicates, the intersection, kind of like the intersection or interaction between mobile computing and cloud computing. So um, mobile there are I would say three different flavors of mobile cloud computing. The first flavor of mobile cloud computing is simply when you have uh, an app interacting with uh, with the cloud. Like for example, when you'd use Facebook and things like that. So you have a mobile app that is using the cloud to fulfill part of its functionality, right? That would be the most um, basic form of mobile cloud computing. The second flavor of it, of mobile cloud computing, is when you're leveraging other mobile devices to kind of form your cloud. So I need to execute an operation. I know that my mobile device either doesn't have all the data or doesn't have all the computing power to execute it. So I look to other mobile devices to see if maybe as a whole we can we can execute that computation. That's another form of mobile cloud computing. Now cyber foraging would be the third form of mobile cloud computing. So that's that's basically the it's it's a form of mobile cloud computing. Right. Tim, thank you for that question. Uh, okay, to our, back to our poll. We got about ninety three percent or clear oh, on the cloud concept. So we can move on. We're getting from there. better. Yeah. Okay. So this is where we are now. So we did a lot of experiments. We built a lot of prototypes. Um, we gathered a lot of data because we wanted to make, make sure that, that whatever we selected as our, as our tactical cloud implementation would be the best for the characteristic of edge, characteristics of edge environments that I mentioned before. The, the dynamic context, the intermittent connectivity, uh, the, uh, the lower computation uh, power. And what we ended up doing was a combination of cache VM and cloudlet push. Now, um, the data showed us definitely that there was lower energy consumption and less requirements placed on the mobile device because if you combine um, cache VM and cloudlet push, you have the freedom of really not having anything at all on the mobile device or maybe already having some apps on it. Um, it's also, it's also uh, we also consider it a very, f a simple form of, of provisioning in the sense that um, when you use VM synthesis, you have the, I don't want to say the trouble, but you do have to, you know, create the VM overlays. When you have application virtualization, you do have to create all these package applications. So we thought of of, of com combining cache VM and cloudlet push would give us very very simple uh, provisioning, um, because first of all, constructing service VMs is not it's not hard at all. You basically you take a VM, you install something in it, and you have a service VM. And uh, from the mobile client perspective, at runtime. Either I don't have the application in which I, in which case I use Cloudlet Push, or I do have the application in which I'm basically using using Cache VM. Uh, also, we we opted for or we agreed that that doing a VM based approach would be would be much better for the types of environments that we were operating in because um, it it does promote uh, promote resilience and survivability. And what I mean by this is because. Um, for example, live VM migration is a is a out of the box capability supported by many of the uh, virtual machine managers out there. You can imagine a situation where you can migrate uh, a VM, a running VM, from one cloudlet to another, um, and that will allow me to continue operations. Whether whether the reason why I I, I have to migrate is is just just mobility and the keep I'm I'm moving far away from this cloudlet and I'm getting closer to this cloudlet or this cloudlet is really loaded, so I'm going to move some of my load over to another cloudlet, or it could be something as simple as, I'm working here, a vehicle came up, to, came to pick me up, I'm going to move to the cloudlet that's on the vehicle, so I'm just going to manually move all my computation from this, from this cloudlet to this cloudlet. Um, obviously, it also supports, uh, supports scalability, and this is just basically what is done in the cloud data centers, because we can start and stop VMs based on the needs that we have. Um, also, um, the request response, having a very thin client and, and a very thick server that operate in a request response manner, um, it 
they seem to be, be much better for, for, for DIL environments because you're basically saying, do this computation for me, here's your computation, instead of maintaining state over time. Now, there are trade-offs, of course, and, and this is something that we recognize and we, and we accept it as part of our implementation, is that it relies on cloudlets that are pre-provisioned. We assume that the, that the people that are putting these cloudlets together know what capabilities are going to be necessary for this particular mission, or that maybe even if it's just the deployment time or at, or at intermittent periods, we're going to be connected to a core or a data center to obtain some of these, um, some of these capabilities. So the di this diagram on this slide is showing the, uh, the tactical cloudlet architecture. Um, and it's not, now it's an instantiation of with some of the products that we selected as part of our implementation. So um, as I've hinted to on many of, on many of my, on my slides and during my talk, uh, we are using Android as our, as our mobile platform. Um, and as far and as our, on the Cloudlet host, uh, we're, we're using a, we're using a, a Linux-based uh, Cloudlet host. And as our virtual machine manager, we've, we're using KVM simply because it's it's very simple to use and it really has a lot of the capabilities that we that we need. It also has a very small footprint, which is also another characteristic of, of edge environments and some of the some of the tactical environments. Um, and so. Um, some of the products are there. Um, like I said before, for discovery, you're using simply an Avahi daemon, which is an implementation of ZeroConf. Um, now, what is a little bit different from the reference architecture is that because we selected to use a pre-provisioning pre mechanism, um, we do need some type of, of management console, which again is another, another concept that is very common in, in cloud computing environments, which is why this talk is called Moving Cloud Computing to the Edge. So we have a, a simple management console that also runs on the Cloudlet server and allows you to install service VMs, to start service VMs, to stop service VMs, and, and to just see what you have on a Cloudlet. And that is a Cloudlet manager that is towards the bottom. And the Cloudlet API is the, is the API that allows us to do a lot of these um, operations that I talked about before that enable both cache VM and Cloudlet push. Um, so basically that is, that is more or less the, the, the implementation that we rely on. As you will see, we also have a VM, uh, a service repository. The service repository has the VM images that correspond in this case to the service VMs. And it also has the uh, Cloudit Ready app packages as APK files because we're using, we're using Android and we just use MongoDB simply to store that information because it's also very simple to use. So how does, how does this implementation in the end work? Um, so you'll see on the, on the left side of this slide that we have like three different pieces. We have service selection, cloudlet selection, and cloudlet push. So as, as, as part of our implementation, I haven't talked about this in the previous slides, we also accept the fact that I could be in proximity of multiple cloudlets. So there has to be some kind of cloudlet selection process. So, so far, all the, exper all the, um, the, the data that we showed and also a lot of the explanations that we showed assumed that there was only one cloudlet around. But what if there's more than one cloudlet? And this particular, um, our baseline implementation accepts that possibility. So in this case, the cloudlet, um, if I'm going to use from, if I'm going to execute from the cloudlet client GUI, it means that I don't have the application, which means I have to go to the app store. So in this case, I tell the cloudlet client, what services do you have? And the, and the Cloudlet server responds with the list of services that it has from all the available Cloudlets. I build an aggregated list of services, and in this case, uh, from that aggregated list of services, I select the service that I want. Um, the Cloudlet client selects the best Cloudlet with the service. Now, one of the things that I mentioned at the beginning is that one of our goals from an R&D perspective is to have a very, very flexible architecture because we want to be able to experiment with a lot of things. So in our architecture, you can plug in what we call a Cloudlet selection algorithm. The algorithm that we're using at this point is a very, a very simple algorithm. It just selects the cloudlet that is less loaded. But you can imagine replacing that algorithm with any other type of algorithm, the cloud that is more powerful, the cloud that is closer. The, I mean, there are many algorithms that you can replace it with. In our case, we just it's a very simple algorithm that chooses the less loaded cloudlet. And it gets the application from this cloudlet and it installs it. So basically, this is kind of like the cloudlet push part of the, part of the equation. Now, what if I already have the application? Well, if I already have the application, what I'm doing is more or less, um, more or less cache VM. So in this case, I am requesting a particular service. Um, it's also building the list. It is selecting the, the best cloud that, that has that service, and now it's simply starting the service VM and returning. So this is what I mean by what, that we combined um, cache VM with Cloudlet push. So you can either have the application or you don't have the application. So where are we now? So that was, that was the past. I'm getting into a little bit of the present, and now I'm going to go a little bit into the future. 
So things that we have, we have done on that, uh, based on that cloud implementation. So we've come up with what we call the standard packaging of service vans. I'm not going to call it a standard, but we, we come, came up with a, standard, a standardized way of representing service VMs. Why is that the case? Because we want, to, we want people that are using Cloudless to be able to load uh, service VMs um, either using the Cloudlet Manager, or maybe there is an enterprise level service VM repository, or maybe I have it on a thumb drive, or maybe it could be the case that I have it on my mobile device and I just want to you know, connect my mobile device to the Cloudlet. But we want to be able to, 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 to be able to obtain these capabilities from multiple, multiple mechanisms, and in that case, you need some kind of standardized, uh, standardized way of packaging. Um, we've also added um, capabilities to improve uh, mobile systems, what we call survivability. So we added, like I said before, we added an optimal Cloudlet selection algorithm. Uh, we've implemented a, a Cloudlet handoff, which is, which is live migration. Uh, we are currently able to do it manually, which means that we are able to tell it, I want, you to mute, I want you to move this computation from this Cloudlet to this Cloudlet. And at the moment, we're working on what we call automatic migration, which is being able to move that move that VM based on other characteristics, uh, like I said before, such as uh, potential disconnection or mobility or um, excessive load or things like that. Um, we are also, um, this year, we're hoping to be able to work on support for data reliance systems. So, um, so far, a lot of the applications that, are, that I've described are very, uh, what I would call self-contained in the sense that if I want to use face recognition, I can have my face database on the cloud. I don't need to, to reach back to the enterprise. But what if I have a scenario in which I do need to reach back to the enterprise, whether I have to report on data that I'm seeing or I want to be able to consolidate with data from other clouds around the world. So, so what we're trying to do is add these capabilities for, um, that are specific to data reliant applications. How do we, how do we support data reliant applications uh, in, a, in, a, in a situation where they, there might not be connectivity back to the enterprise core, but we want to keep on functioning even if we're disconnected from the enterprise. And specifically for FY15, for fiscal year 15, we're working on trusted identities in disconnected environments. So, um, if you if you look at the way we are doing that we're doing discovery, you know what a mobile device does is basically say, oh, are there cloudlets around there? Well, as a cloudlet, I want to make sure that whoever is asking for me is really a, a friendly person, and and from a mobile device perspective, I also want to know if, if I see a cloudlet that's saying I'm a cloudlet, I'm a cloudlet. I want to make sure it's also a friendly cloudlet. So that is from a research perspective. That's our focus for for this particular year for um, fiscal year um, 15. Now. Let's look at Cloudless beyond tactical environments. So, so far I've explained Cloudless from the tactical perspective, from the, from the perspective of our stakeholders here at the SEI. But let's look beyond tactical environments because, um, and it's going to be on my last slide, um, me and also the, our, our research group, we strongly believe that cyber foraging is going to become almost like a built-in capability into, in, in mobile, mobile applications, and we'll see why. So um, think of cloud, Cloudless outside of tactical environments. Um, think of having Cloudless inside your home. Um, you know that your cloudlet, uh, your cloudlet, uh, you can work standalone on your applications, on your pads, and whatever you can when you're away from home. But once you get home, the, your your mobile device is able to detect that you are within your within proximity of your home cloudlet, and now it executes all that expensive computation and stuff on your home cloudlet, so it's, you're not draining the battery on your mobile device. Um, Another home scenario, so think of your cable company. Uh, those of you that have cable service have a cable box in your home. What if we added some more computing power to that, to that cable box? And for example, you can have a situation where uh, your cable company uh, forms some form of, of alliance with a video streaming company. So in that case, you could have your cloudlet um, cache a lot of your movies, a lot of your games, a lot of the things that you play. And what you're gaining with that is really an improved user experience because now when you're watching movies on your mobile device or when you're trying to play online games on your mobile device, you're not going to the cloud for every interaction. You're going to your cloud which is right there in your house. So it really improves the mobile experience because you're really decreasing latency. And another, situ another, another way in which you could use these cable box, obviously for all the home automation and home security and things like that. Another scenario, um, and this is something that we, are, we actually um, had conversations about it with, with potential stakeholders, is to use it for, um, 
for traffic control or for connected vehicles or things like that. So imagine a situation where you have cloudless and traffic lights. And the traffic lights are, are running these cloudless because they have the power to run them. There's you know, servers attached to the cloudlets. And you're able to, uh, to be able to use these cloudlets to, for example, to, do, to control traffic, to inform of accidents, and to support a lot of the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication that is being promoted nowadays. Um, going a little bit to the right, the next scenario, you see a person in a car. So imagine this is a field researcher. Uh, what is on the bottom is a, uh, a, weather, um, a weather monitor. And, uh, and you, for example, you could have a, a sensors in the field collecting data and sending them to a cloud that is in this researcher's vehicle. The vehicle stopped to do some research and the, and the cloud is running in the vehicle. And also uh, that researcher is also doing a lot of work um, on, the, on the mobile device, is trying to execute some data, is capturing some samples, wants to process those samples. Uh, you could also think of this as a medic. Ima imagine a medic, um, a, a doctor in a type of like an impoverished environment, let's say, put it that way, uh, trying to run some of these very expensive diagnoses, not being able to do it on the mobile device, but being able to take advantage of the cloud that is running in that doctor's vehicle to do some of that. That's another potential scenario for cloud lips. And finally, there is the, uh, well, there's the Starbucks scenario, which is just, just sitting in a coffee shop. So what if, what if, Cloudless became so pervasive that you know they're, they're available everywhere. You can go to your favorite coffee shop and sit in your coffee shop, and your mobile device is, uh, is capable of discovering there, that there is a nearby cloudlet, and it's going to try to play your favorite game on that cloudlet and not on your mobile device so you don't use up all your battery. Or maybe, you know, um, all, the, all the, the runtime provisioning uh, mechanisms that we talked about at the beginning are, are becoming better. And maybe I can just say, look, I was, working on, I was working on this. Can you please, can I please kind of send it to you so I can work on the server in the meantime and then get it back? So there are lots and lots of applications beyond tactical environments that I also might want to make you aware of. Um, because in the end, the goal of what we're trying to do is really to support this rich sensing and these rich interaction capabilities uh, with mobile devices so that it's seamless and, you're, and, and it's seamless that I'm executing um, either computation intensive or data intensive applications. And uh, where am I going with this? Where I'm going with this is, and this is why I believe that cyber foraging is going to become a main, a main component, is that there are so many studies, and you'll see the references at the end of the presentation, that are showing uh, you know, just the pervasiveness of smartphones and tablets. Um, smart, the number of smartphones has already surpassed the numbers of laptops and, and desktops that are being bought nowadays. Um, the growth rate of e-readers and tablets is growing. It's growing. It's not. It's not higher than any, anything uh, yet. But the, if the rate continues, it's going to. It, it's. It's going to be. You know, a matter of a very few years. Um, Smartphones and tablets are becoming the main computing device for many users. You know, people want to be able to do their computation on their, you know, on their couch, and they don't want to have their laptop on them. They just want to use their tablet. And also, there's not uncommon for there to be multiple mobile devices per user and per, per household. I know that my household is guilty of that. Um, and what is this? What is this doing? It's really driving organizations to put to push out more and more and more and more content and functionality to mobile users. So what's hap So what is that? What is that causing? Well, it's because the, your tablets and your e-readers are becoming your main computation, computational device, you're expecting to be able to do what you do on a desktop, to be able to do it on your, laptop, on your, on your smartphone, right, or your tablet. However, you, we really have to keep in mind what I said before. Mobile devices are always going to lag behind their PC counterparts due to size and also due to battery limitations. There is lots of research going on in batteries, but it's, it's not advancing at the same pace as, as other as the research in the in like hardware and software. Um, also, the more and more people that use mobile devices, more the more and more data that is getting to the internet and the more congested our networks are becoming. And so relying on the cloud for to provide a, a, a rich user experience is is it's going to become impossible because you just you're just not going to be able to support all these mobile devices and all this data, and it's only going to get worse with the with the concept of Internet of Things. So if now our appliances start transmitting data and there are sensors transmitting data and our mobile devices transmit data, it's just a lot of data, which is why I strongly believe that something like cloudlets or some type of intermediate between the cloud and the mobile devices is going to need to become a reality, um, and it. That's why I think it's going to become a standard feature of many mobile applications, just because it's the environment that, are, that is pushing us this way. Um, now, from a software engineering perspective, what, what is going to happen is that if this becomes a reality, then we're going to have to build our applications in that way. We have to come to, we're going to have to build our applications to be able to sense for these cloudlets around us, these other, these other resources on, on which we can offload application. And, uh, 
the benefits are huge. The benefits are huge in terms of business opportunities. Just, just think about some of the examples I talked about. The benefits are huge in mobile user experience, but it's going to require a shift in, in the way we do software engineering because now we have to think about not only the resources that we have, but the resources that we could have. So with that, I think I would like to end. Okay. Terrific, uh, terrific presentation, Grace. And before we get into Q&A, um, just a reminder that we'll, a survey will pop up at the end of the presentation. We request that you fill that out as your feedback is always greatly appreciated. So let's get into some questions for Grace. Sure. Um, uh, one from Bart asking, what about denial of service attacks? Mm -hmm. It seems mm -hmm. simple to me to keep a cloudlet busy mm -hmm. such that it cannot provide services to other clients. No, absolutely. A absolutely. Okay. Um, so, so the, uh, the environments in which we operate in, like I said, are, are tactical environments. The advantage that we have, and I'm not saying that denial of service is not possible, but the advantage that we have is that it's more of a bounded environment, meaning that we know, we know um, so if we, for example, if we deploy a, a cloud-lit per team, we know how big the team is, right? So, we, so we, 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 we have a bounded environment. But if we do move towards, if we do move towards the, the more unbounded environment, so going, so if I go back to my slide that had all the different uh, potential scenarios, if I go to the coffee shop scenario, um, where you know anybody could use a cloud, that then then it does. It, it one of the I think one of the big challenges is going to be security in general, not just denial of service, but but security in general, because um, there are environments such as the one we operate in where we can have a lot of control over who uses a cloud, lid, but there are others that where you don't have that control. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, next one from Joan asking mm -hmm. by the edge. So do you mean the same thing as an edge computing? Oh yeah, so so yeah, I should have clarified that at the beginning. Yes, when I say the edge, I mean basically the same as an edge computing. Um, I'm sure all of you are aware edge computing is a, a term that was coined by by a company called Akamai many years ago, where what they wanted to do was to push uh, web content uh, close to where the users were accessing it. So basically what they would do for an organization if you hired Akamai was that it would deploy copies of your website in multiple servers around the world so that people using it from different locations would get a, a better experience. This is exactly what I mean by edge computing. Putting, and I, actually I would argue that I'm, it's more than edge computing because I'm not only taking content to the, to, the edge, to the edge, but I'm also taking computation and data and all that goes with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, so a number of questions asking just about slides and recording. So the slides are available now in the files tab within your console. You can download them now. The archive mm -hmm. will be ready by tomorrow or the next day. We'll send out an email mm -hmm. uh, with the location for that. Mm -hmm. So the last question in the queue, so if you have any other questions, feel free to type them in now. But from, uh, from Lawrence asking, what would it take to deploy a cyber foraging system in the field? Okay. So if you if you if you believe that the that the tactical cloud implementation that we have is is the way to go, so what you need what you would need is a just a a laptop. If, if dep it really depends on on how many users you're going to support, but let's say you take a a robust laptop into the field, uh, you make sure that the laptop has the uh, the cloudlet software on it. What I mean by cloudlet software is the the kind of like the API part, the cloudlet server part of it, and also the cloudlet manager that I that I talked about. So you have all that deployed on your cloudlet, and then you have mobile devices that um, that are running the cloudlet client server, and and that's really all you need because the, if when when you package all your when you package all your Cloudlet with all the service VMs that you need, you're also packaging all the applications that go with it. So that's all you need. It's actually quite quite simple. Okay. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Uh, folks, that's all the questions we have. So we'll wait about just another 30 seconds. Feel free to type them in. We're about 2.27 and we need to be done by 2.30. So we'll, we'll just wait to see if anybody else has any questions. Um, just while we wait for that, you had mentioned security. Are you aware of any other security work going on at the SCI in mobile computing? Is that I know that's not in your yeah, it's not area. no, but there there are. I mean, there are there are groups that are there are groups within the SCI within CERT that are that are trying to al analyze vulnerabilities that are specific to, for example, to Android and to iOS. Um, there is also uh, other groups working on security from the perspective of so BYOD, bring your own device, is a big is a big trend. You know where people want to be able to use their work. Um, devices, sorry, their home devices right. at work as well. So that obviously opens a lot of security vulnerabilities and breaches. And I know that there is other work at the SCI that it is exploring that that part of it. Okay, mm -hmm. terrific, folks. That's going to wrap it up. Uh, I would like to invite you to our next webinar. It will be on January fifteenth. It will be a software architecture uh, virtual event with uh, SCI fellow Linda Northrup and Rick Kaysman, and we'll send that and in invite to everybody. Thanks again for everyone attending. Everyone, Grace. Thanks again for the great presentation. Yep. And everyone have a great day.